mic check. One, two. Tom, use your word. Hey, you. That's original. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Original Freedom Podcast. Super stoked to have you on board today. Um, back in the Raleigh studio, and uh, here today we have a special guest, a dear friend, and somebody we're uh, really grateful to have. Two Lamb from Ronin Tactics uh, is here with us uh, for the next couple of days, actually. We're starting off a two-day film fest. Uh, I'm going to do some storytelling, and um, one of the biggest stories that you're going to hear today is one uh, that's, that's truly, uh, in our belief system, a version, a beautiful version of the American dream. Uh, if I were to tell you that today we're going to tell you the story of someone that literally escaped from uh, genocide in Vietnam as a child um, and then ended up in one of the most military towns on the face of this planet <laughs> known as Fayetteville, or he went from Vietnam to Fayetteville, um, <laughs> <That's pretty true. laughs> ended up with a Green Beret as a dad, ended up becoming a Green Beret himself, ended up going back to his homeland of Vietnam as a Green Beret, freeing the oppressed, ended up in Delta Force, ended up in combat, ended up as a team sergeant uh, in Special Forces, and furthermore, went on to build himself a career after the military mm -hmm. that has enabled him to absolutely continue out the, uh, the next version, not only of his warrior path, but of the American dream, uh, because if there's any of you that still buy into the bullshit years ago that owning a house was the American mm -hmm. dream, uh, it's not the case. Right? The American dream, uh, as we know it, is to be able to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, within the, the, the confines of what we have in place, uh, without limit. And that's what another aspect of the, uh, Two's life uh, that we've had the pleasure of watching him build over the last few years as he's, he's built out Ronin, as he's ended up on the History Channel, as he has been outspoken in the veteran space on, on helping share his message of healing. You know, if I were, if I were to tell you that that's all the stuff you're going to hear about today, uh, I'd actually miss the mark. But that's going to be a good part of it. And... Uh, Two, super, super grateful to have you here on the show. Tom and I have been looking forward to this now since we spoke. Mm -hmm. And um, if you would, please kick us off with uh, a one over the world of uh, what your story has been. And, and Tom and I are going to probably drag you places and make talk you better about yourself than you normally try to do because <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to let you be humble. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. For having me here. Um, yeah, man. Back in Raleigh, North Carolina, it's great to be here. Uh, there's a certain smell to this state when I say that. It's the pine tree smell that, yeah. that we're used to, uh, you know, in, in the Special Force. Everybody will know that smell. But um, so a little bit about myself. Um, you know, there's a, uh, a philosophy. There's a, there's a phase that uh, I, I want to talk about. There's... They say, you know, a journey of a thousand miles began with a single step, mm -hmm. one step. My first step was one of war. I was born in 1974, Saigon fell in 75. So I was born in the midst of, you know, a, a failing state uh, in Vietnam. The communists was coming over, imposing their uh, communist ideologies on us. I was two years old at the time. Um, they drug us out. Um, Basically, if you if you read what happened after post Vietnam, the communists came in and they they started acting uh, acts of genocide. You right. think about the the killing fields. Sure. Uh, they would take people to the rice paddies, bag their heads. They'll they'll kill them. They're just wiping out that race, that existence. My uncle served in the Vietnamese Navy, so he was working hand in hand with the Americans. At the time when when Saigon fell, he was in prison in uh, what they called uh, re-education camps. Mm. When we got a hold of my uncle, he, he had no skin in the bottom of his foot. Th that's those are torture camps. Um, so as they opposed their communist ideology on us, uh, Saigon started falling, and my mother um, basically took her whole life savings. My grandfather took his life savings and said, there's no fucking way in hell my two grandsons are going to grow up to be communists. Mm. So we we were smuggled out of country on a small fishing boat, right? Like you think about hundreds of refugees stuffed in a small little fishing boat. Thousands of ships are trying to leave. Thousands of people are trying to leave this uh, 
south in uh, Vietnam. So that brings in the bandits from um, Thailand, and you have the Vietnamese bandits. So when I say bandits, they're, they're like the piety that's going on in yeah. Somalia, right? So all these Vietnamese people are leaving, trying to save their lives, and the bandits would come and stop the ships and rape, kill, and pillage and rob everything off the boats. And who was on that ship at that time with you? Too? My 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 uh, biological father was on the ship, my uh, my mother, my brother, and myself. And how old were you at the time? I was two. Okay. Yeah. So we, we barely escaped, but <laughs> there was a there was a really interesting story was, you know, I was always like a uh, explorer as a child was a curious George right? right so we almost missed a boat <laughs> <laughs> because of me because I did my so we had hardly any money you know the money that we had was you know these little small little uh, go bars that my my grandfather gave us to try to smuggle us out of country so I saw a duck and I took my only pair of slippers and threw at the duck and then I decided to jump into the water and got stuck <laughs> And my mother was trying to find me, and the ship was ready to leave. Like, we're trying to flee Vietnam <laughs> right. There's a lot of genocide, right? Yeah. And here I am chasing a duck. Right. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> my mother pulled me out. Of course, I got beat. Um, but anyways, to get back with those pirates, we somehow navigated past that. And I, I was, you know, years later, I asked my mother, what was the strategy? Mm. And then she goes, well, you know, the captain of the ship was part of the Navy at one time, so he knew the, the bandits were around this area, so he would cut his engines off, cut all the lights off, and then just kind of sail across, and we, we kind of escaped in that, yeah. that way. So we, we escaped Vietnam, and we made ourselves into the coast of Indonesia. At that time, the Coast Guard stopped us. They shot at our, our ships and stopped us. Yeah. And... Um, there was, imagine, there's a bunch of just floating fishermen boats on the coast of Indonesia. Everybody's trying to leave. Mm. So they, they roped in our boat. We were the center boat, and there was two other boats on the side of us. So they roped in our boats, and they're pulling us back out the ocean. They don't want right. the refugees <laughs> in their country. No kidding. So on that initial pull, the two outer boats actually tipped over because of, you know, you think about the center point on the, mm -hmm. on the pull boat. So those two boats tipped over, and I asked my mother what happened. She goes... Hundreds died. Mm. Mm. They never came and rescued them. Hundreds. They cut the line. And in fact, they drug us out in the uh, deeper into the ocean. And then uh, my mother s said, you know, something is wrong, you know, here. And they, they end up shooting our engine, cut the line, and they pretty much left us to die. Mm -hmm. Right. So here I am at two years old, <laughs> floating out in the middle of the ocean, watching people perish. Mm -hmm. So there was a, uh, my mother told me a, a, a story. There was a lady on the boat that was really rich. She was filthy rich in Saigon, right? She had the best clothes, the best nails. She treated people cruelly because she was just rich. Royalty. Right. She was royalty. But she escaped on the same boat. And um, in the end, money couldn't save her. Mm -hmm. mm. You understand? So as they as she died they threw her dead body over the ocean wow. so we were we were basically floating around yeah you were cut away it's right yeah. we're no engine we were floating <laughs> around in the middle of the ocean <laughs> and uh, my mother said people were dying of starvation <coughs> think about seer school it was like yeah. i was indoctrinated into seer training <laughs> right. at two years old <laughs> you know so um of course i don't remember any of it right yeah. because i was two years old but I, I truly feel the energy stays with you. Mm -hmm. You know, they there's scientific data from two to four. You know, that's the time oh, that you learn and it, it emojis you who you are. Well, at two to four was, you know, I was escaping from my life. And you know, what was interesting about this whole story was so we were drifting out in the middle of the ocean. And if you don't believe in God, well, let me tell you a God story, <laughs> all right? Because as we were drifting and people were dying, we got caught up in a storm. And mm. the storm washed us, my mother said, it washed us deeper into the ocean. People were prepping to die. Yeah. So the storm washed through, and then somehow that storm washed us into a pretty much intersection of where a Russian supply boat was going to go through the Pacific Ocean to go into Singapore. So they were crossing the Pacific Ocean in that same lat long when yeah. we're floating in that same 
you know, <coughs> location in the middle of this mass ocean. Yeah, what are the odds? What are the odds? Yeah. So that's truly a, um, a work of God in, in my eyes. So the, the Russians picked us up. So they picked us up and they loaded us on the ship. But what I want to tell you about this, this, this first <laughs> lesson right here is that um, it was the Russian ideology that took me out of my country. Wow. It was the Russian ideology that killed my, my family. But it was also the same <laughs> Russian ideology that looked past that and saved me hmm. and, yeah. and, and loaded me on the boat. That was my first lesson in humanity, that not everybody is the same. You know, there's evils and there's good in, in everybody. <laughs> right. Right. So we they took us to um, Indonesia where we basically docked at a refugee camp. Monks from the temples would come down and basically took care of us. So for, uh, my mother said for six to eight months, we were at this refugee camp. Now, we would have to go out in the woods, uh, the jungles, to cut down lumber, to build fires, to cook. They, they were basically living like tribes. We would fish mm -hmm. to get out get our food. That's how we were living. They were letting you occupy space there, but they weren't giving. Right, it. right. <laughs> we were just living off the land, yeah. you know. So uh, at that age, I was kind of running around the jungles of Indonesia, you know, living like a, a refugee. So my my uh, aunt, um, my my mother's older sister, married a American special forces lieutenant, and he was he got stabbed by a bayonet um, during one of the raids. Their G base got ran over, so he got evacuated out of Vietnam. But he ended up marrying her, so they lived in the states together. So he. During that time frame, you know, you think about a lot of refugees were leaving Vietnam. Well, he was able to expedite the paperwork because he's an American. Right. Right. So he basically sponsored us to come over. Well, because he was a Green Beret. <laughs> right. He's getting stuff done. Right. <laughs> so um, the home of the Green Berets is Fayetteville, North Carolina, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So as I left Indonesia, that was where I went. I went to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Right, so let's talk about that <laughs> demographics. <laughs> during that time. Right, during that time, right? So post-Vietnam, um, the biggest military base in, I would say, the United States, right, mm -hmm. for the Army? Army base, for sure, yeah. Home of special operations. Yeah, yeah. Home of the Green Berets. So uh, that's what I grew up around. Okay, so my, my mother... And these yeah. and all these Green Berets and everyone on this post have been fighting, fighting and Vietnamese. killing Vietnamese. Vietnamese. Yeah. yeah. Right. Key point. So you know what was what was unique about it was the Green Berets knew my story. Mm -hmm. They accepted me for who I am. It it's it was the the regular army kids, yeah. you know, that I was raised around. Those the locals. were right, the locals. They would call me all sorts of racist names. So when I say that I dealt with racism, I dealt with oh, yeah. <laughs> I believe at the 10th degree, man, and you know, and I, I, I understand when people talk about racism and how much is that's a hate crime, and I got it, I understand, I was taught that lesson, you know, but yep. what I took out of it was, now everybody's the same, mm -hmm. and I, I, I truly feel that my character was formed during that boat, you know, when, when I said, well, now everybody's the same, it was the Russian ideology, you know, they could have easily... So oh, that's the enemy, and left yep. us there to die. Yeah. But they didn't. They they looked at a uh, a higher purpose of humanity. Yeah. So I was kind of really thought I, I I was brought up that way, you know, for yeah. for a long time. So um, I never really got into the racism thing, man. Right. I never played victim to it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I got my Even ass handed to me, <laughs> right? I got my ass handed to me almost every day. Daily. Yeah, daily. They call me names, but you know, I was raised. Uh, so my mother eventually remarried to uh, American uh, Special Forces. So I was raised with the Ballad of the Green. Every morning. That damn dun 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 dun, <laughs> dun 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 like he would play the ballad of Green Beret every. He's, he's fucking legit. It's legit. Every morning we had a bunk bed and I had to make the bed. He had to bounce a quarter off. That was my upbringing. I was indoctrinated into a military life at eight years old. Right. Now when I say I was raised in a in a strict military upbringing, my papa, my my uh, step grandfather, he was the greatest generation. Mm. You Absolutely. see what I mean? Yeah. So we were raised with hard manual labor, hard work. We knew what hard work meant. Yeah. 
you know. So my father, he owned uh, AWS, the, the company that makes the salt ladders for the unit. Right, right. right. So, right. Yeah. so that's why I was, I was deburrowing unit ladders when I, I can seriously say that at 12 years old. I have pictures of me deburrowing these assault ladders <laughs> at 12 years old. Eventually, I was carrying these assault <laughs> ladders in, in, uh, combat. in combat. But that, that was, my lifestyle was, that was it. Like, I, I had a neighbor, his name was Mr. Dubrell. He was a Sante Raider. He was a wow. blue boy element. Yeah, and yeah. he was talking about how he killed Charlie yeah. as he's looking at me. You know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, but that was my life, you know. <laughs> I was, and I thought that was normal. Yeah, and it was. It was in in a military wow. life, right? But they could differentiate between who they went to war with, and then looking at you as a young man. You they know, see none me. Of that, you none know. of that bled over because no. of who they were. As and you know, in the Vietnam, and uh, the special forces role in Vietnam was, you know, the mountain yards, right? They oh, they yeah. live with the people. They 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 love that culture. They, they didn't just people. live with the people. They depended on those people for their lives. Right. right. They began. They fought together. So imagine at twelve years old, <laughs> you're hearing these stories from the guys that actually live with the tribes. Yeah, man. Right. And then the one thing we were talking about before was super interesting to me is, uh, I mean, again, how principally so many things translate over, um, you know, was whenever you said, hey, um, you know, whenever you were getting your ass kicked daily. I was being bullied. Yeah. And, uh, I but now define bully. Like no one was talking angry to you. Like you were physically getting your ass whipped. Yeah, I was getting <laughs> beat. I would. Yeah. Uh, I would they have. They weren't saying just mean things. They to would you. have target locations. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a post on Instagram that made fun. No, of you. It's no. Like someone actually no, beat, your ass. beat my ass. We, have, we do have to educate young folks that that okay. happened back then. So they would pick the X, which in in special forces would identify terrain, right? <laughs> so they knew my route. They knew the best funnel points of terrain they knew you know i was going to walk right and then they'll find it and beat my ass well i would say beat my ass there's usually 48 stomping on me you mm -hmm. know so once i go you know in a in a crow position now i'm starting to see uh, boots to my my head right so you know after dealing with that every single day or just a name calling you know it's sure. just you know it's it's uh it's tiring, right? Brother <laughs> <laughs> gets tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was tired, like not just going to school. I was tired of like you evading. Were just, you were just trying to get to school. Yeah, right? I was just trying to get to school, and we didn't have very much money. You know, my dad was in the military. Yeah. We didn't have very much money, so you know, the rich kids will make fun of us, and then um, the poor kids will beat me because I was <laughs> different. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> So you and couldn't you, win. So, but you tell advice. you, but you asked your dad what you should do, and what did he tell you? I went to my father, and I <laughs> said, you know, I'm getting my ass beat because I look different. And he goes, oh, okay, and then he he would hear me <laughs> out. A lot of sympathy. He would he would hear me out, and then one thing he always said it stuck to me, and it's still to this day. Yeah. I, I still employ the tactics. Is he said, you know, son, if you can't out beat them, if you can't muscle them, if, they had, if they're physically stronger than you, then you must outthink them. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't tell me how to outthink them, right? right? He just, <laughs> he just but told he, you what you needed to do. What I needed to do, I need to outwit them. And I, I was always like a, a book smart guy. I wasn't very like street smart. I was right. book smart in, in my junior, uh, junior high school year. So I would start looking at routes where they would ambush me. <laughs> and I would literally like bring out a map and go, okay, they beat me here, they beat me here, they beat me here. If I evade and I go around, yeah, it'll take a little longer, but I, maybe I could circumvent this this area here. And if, uh, if I maybe hang out at this location for a little bit, then I can kind of observe mm -hmm. terrain, right? Yeah, so it's military it. tactics right. is why I was You're employing. Reconnaissance. Right, I was doing <laughs> reconnaissance, and I was uh, basically doing uh, surveillance detection routes, yeah. <laughs> you know, and with timing sheets on, on uh <laughs> On my route to school and home, and I, 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 bec I had the ability to successfully evade <laughs> my bullies. Right. Because of that. Yeah. Because of what he said. Let's take you into the military years. Wow. So, academically gifted, war baby, coming out of Vietnam. My mother gave her whole life to my brother and I. Wow. To escape us from Vietnam and, and war. And I made better grades than my brother in school. My brother became a doctor. Mm. So when I went to the MEP Center <laughs> and going, what can you get me in the Army? And they're like, oh, I can get you anything you want. What do you want? You, you got a 130 GT. What do you want? Wow. And I was like, 
I don't know what you got. And then they, the Airborne Ranger contract came up. I wasn't ready to leave home that far at that time because I was raised in Rapidville. I wanted to be there for my mother. So I, I, I opted an Airborne contract. All right, so I went through AIT, Basic Training Airborne School, and then I went to the 82nd. Mm -hmm. So uh, second, three, two, five, I didn't stay there very long because uh, I, uh, when I went there, nobody wanted to go to Ranger School. It was like one of those uh, schools that a lot of young uh, privates were afraid of at yeah. that time, yeah. you know? So I was a PFC when I showed up, and I opted to go to pre-Ranger Ranger School within a month that I got there. Mm -hmm. So within a month, I was in a recondo course, <laughs> right? Going, wow, the army really sucks. They don't really yeah. feed us, but yeah, that's that, the old school. Old school, old school. right? Out of old school. School. right? You know yeah. that recondo oh, yeah. course. I went, oh, yeah. the, I went through that pre-ranger too. Yeah. So you know the, all they remember yeah, the yeah. cattle trucks. Oh yeah, uh, and then they'll kick you out of recondo row and you run yeah. with all your yeah, stuff. Yeah, all your stuff. Yeah. Right. So that was my first duffel uh, bag rucksack, two cases of MREs. Yes, that was my first um, training. Welcome. Welcome. Well, yeah, yeah, in the 80 Deuce, right? So uh, graduated and uh, went to ranger school, graduated, came back. You're just E4 now, tabbed out ranger, right? And I, I went to... Uh, Which is semi-god status, by the way. At yeah, that, that, at, at that time. In the division at back that rank, then. Yeah, at that rank and at that time. 100%. Yeah. Um, especially going to ranger school as a, as a PFC. I was a big deal back yeah. then, you know? I remember kicking open the door, and I had a PFC rank on. I would come in like this <laughs> to show my tab, right? Why not? At the shop. Yeah, it, it was, <laughs> you know that, right? Yeah. Remember those days. But um, then I decided to go to a Lurse company. I wanted to to uh, go to the 18 Airborne Corps Lurse, and it was very hard to leave the 82nd once you're tabbed out. But um, I, I remember one day I showed up formation, and I saw these guys running really fast. Uh, with black PTs on, and they ran up the Kudelkaj, remember the oh Kudelkaj? Yeah. And I broke formation, I ran after them. I don't know what I was doing, I just, I don't, I, I, I don't even know what I was thinking. Something, that energy that is there that they wanted me to run after them. And I ran, they ran up the Kudelkaj, and I was trying to keep up with them, and they end up at this old uh, abandoned barracks, right? And, and it had this uh, F Company scroll. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, they're like, who are you? <laughs> like, what do you want? I'm like, and I slapped a prayer rest. And I'm like, I'm Specialist Lamb, and I want to be here, you know? And they're like, what? And I'm like, I, yes, I want to I work here. And they're like, you even know, you know, I don't know who you guys are, but, you know, it looks pretty badass. Yeah, it right? yeah. <laughs> looks cool. Right? So they're like, well, go talk to First Sergeant Moore. And I went in, he was the First Sergeant. He smoked me for, I would say, a good six hours. You know, the tile. There's that tile yeah. on the floor, and then you, yeah. you, you filled it with sweat. Right, That's what he did. Right, So he smoked me to see if I actually wanted a beer. I did. So um, he gave it me an acceptance letter, came back to the 82nd, and gave it, and they are like, fuck no. <laughs> You're not going. Right? But during that time, it was almost my, my reenlistment thing. Mm -hmm. So they're like, well, I'm going to get out. I, I wasn't going to get out, but I played a game. Sure. I'm going to get out. You don't give me those alerts. So they cut me a alert assignment. I went over to alerts, got on an amphibious reconnaissance to you. And um, decided, you know, after a few wrote, I, I went to JTF six missions. And I thought it was really cool, but I, wanted, I always wanted to be a Green Beret. Mm -hmm. That was why I joined the Army. I, I wanted to um, live with the people. I wanted, I knew the Green Beret mission, mm -hmm. yeah. right? I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be in the village with the people, helping them, you know, more than just combat, you know, I wanted that. Sure. Because I, and I, like I said, it was that energy. Yeah. There was that energy that was pulling me back. I can't describe it, man. It was just that sure. energy, right? So I, I applied for the Green Berets uh, at 20 years old. What year time frame is this? 97. 97. Yeah. So I went through uh, SFAS, Went through uh, the Q course, 18 Bravo, and uh, went to Okinawa, served as a senior Bravo, and then they realized that, hey, you're more than a Bravo, so we're going to, you know, reclass you to a Fox. So when I went through O&I and all that, they, they reclassed me to a Fox. So I serve as a, a Fox on the uh, the SIF teams, uh, senior Bravo on the SIF teams. Uh, I fought a lot. Um Martial arts. I was always a martial artist guy. I fought a lot on the island of Okinawa. 
uh, when I say I fought a lot, there was fight nights at Marine bases, and I would go there and fight. I would fight off the uh, in Naha. I would fight at Budokan. It was it was kind of like the no hose bar at this time. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah, Before it's it a fight guy. For, for those yeah. of you out there, when he says fight, he he means no pads. Yeah, legit. Yeah, ass beaten. Right. So for me, that's just a path of uh, a martial artist. Like y I train in all these forms and styles. If I can't fight, then then I'm not really understanding that at the at the true level. Yeah. So being a Green Beret, I was able to travel through Thailand, Indonesia. I was traveling through Laos. I mean, all through Asia. Right. And during that process, I lived with the villagers. Mm -hmm. So here I am in <coughs> Indonesia, learning the ancient art of Sulat in the Philippines fighting Kali matches, you know, with sticks and knives. And uh, through that time, I just developed my, my warrior skills as a martial artist, mm. you know? And, and the cool thing about, about my, my path was in, in the teachings of martial art was I came to the very roots of the martial arts. Mm. See, martial arts, in, in a lot of people's eyes, is a dojo, it's a, it's a kata, it's a form. No, martial art was truly developed for war. It was to, to fight and defend themselves in their villages in time yeah. of war. It was through the warring states, martial art became a very lethal uh, art. After, you know, the, the countries like, let's say, Japan became from the warring state, became a peaceful state, the martial arts then became diluted into a dojo mm. to, to honor that, that the warrior's path. But through time of long peace, you dilute the lethality out of it. Right. Well, what I'm trying to say here is I came to the true lethality of it because I went to the very roots that was developed. I, I went back to the tribes that are still fighting those tribal wars. Their martial art was never diluted. Mm -hmm. mm. Pure. Pure. So during that process, I would take in all these pure forms of martial arts, right? And, and through my knowledge, I kind of know what worked for me anyways. And then imagine, like Bruce Lee says, you know, be able to take a a form and style and put it into your world. Well, my world was a commando. I was a Green Beret. Yeah. yeah. Right? So my forms and style, I had to change to, dude, I can't go to the ground and do jiu-jitsu. In full kit. Right? <laughs> yeah. In full kit. You know, I had yeah. to move. I had to be able to pull a blade. I had to be able to employ certain weapons or certain tactics at certain different ranges. So my martial arts was then morphed into the teams. Mm-hmm. So I took the pure forms and morphed into the teams, and that's where I kind of see Rodin today with, with, yeah. with my styles. But what I want to say was during that process, as me developing as a martial artist and growing as a young Green Beret, I caught an eye of, you know, the, 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 the uh, group sergeant major that was about to go back to the unit. Mm. Uh, when I would go to Thailand, I would fight, mm -hmm. right? I would just fight, and where I am, I would just go and fight because I, I want to experience that, that, uh, that culture. So I was in Thailand and I was going through a jump master course and uh, <laughs> and we were at Lopuri and I would go and, and fight on the weekends where everybody would go to, to Bangkok. I would go on the weekends and train in the Muay Thai camp and fight, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, he was hanging out with my friends and I was fighting a Muay Thai match and basically he said, hey, have him contact me. I want to offer him a position in the unit. So uh, he left. Uh, my friend gave me the card. He said, before you say no, he said that you're going to get to fight anybody you want. You get to go and travel and get the best experience in, you know, anywhere in the Army when it comes to this. So my rotation was to the Philippines. So I, I couldn't you know, just apply. I had to go and serve with my team in the Philippines. So right. I went and served with the team in the Philippines. And towards the end of my trip in Zamboanga, I uh, contacted the unit recruiter dropped the application. They flew, this is no lie, they flew in a airplane into a dirt trail road that I, that I set up the runway. Right. I loaded my bags, they flew me out to Manila, and I was in Fort Bragg doing the 18 mile within 24 hours <laughs> <laughs> from Zambawanga. <laughs> right. That's and then uh, I got hired on in a unit, uh, worked there for roughly eight years, doing a lot of uh, surveillance work for the unit. And after eight years, I, I, I miss the teams, man. You know, yeah. it's just a different mentality in that unit. Uh, it's very fast-paced. Uh, and I miss being on the ground with the, with the ODAs. Mm -hmm. So at that time, uh, Libya, uh, 
the annex was attacked. Um, so Tenth Group was then starting up a uh, crisis response for the continent of Africa, AFRICOM, and um, got interviewed on. Took a uh, recce sniper team, took them into Libya, and uh, did a couple missions out in Cameroon, anti-poaching stuff, uh, protected the president around uh, Africa, and then that's. I would say that's when I ran into uh, my dark time. Mm. See, when when things when you are uh, the top of your game, mm -hmm. right? Everything's crystal clear. You you just you need to know the dynamic stuff. Been but doing then, it all your life, right? Been doing it all your life. Complex missions, as in protecting the president, uh, going in, finding, fixing, finishing. You know, what I mean, those are complex missions, but oh man, yeah. we can execute like that. Yeah. I had problems deciding what to eat <laughs> <laughs> when I came home. I had the problem. How to get home. How to get home. I had the problem um, just going to a grocery store, making simple decisions as in, do I want this freaking cereal or I want this one? Like, literally, I and was getting having... getting pissed off because you couldn't yeah, figure it out. Yeah, I was having a, uh, <laughs> a breakdown in my thought process. Yeah, yeah. And I, I never really thought about it as in, I just thought I was uh, really tired. That I was tired, you know, because I've been, dude, I was going on 14 and a half years of on and off war at that time. Right. So I was tired, and the continent of Africa really took a lot out of me because it wasn't a war zone. It was a conflict area, so you don't have the assets that you have, and you're doing complex missions over here. Yeah. You know? So, uh, but I started losing my, my passion for things. I, I stopped caring, mm -hmm. you know, stopped caring about uh, life. Really, when I say life, not like a, I was things not, that used to you, things that used to be very important. Well, when we talked about it last night, it was uh, you and I shared. Uh, we all did. It's like, hey, there's things in life that I know I should care about, and, and I, I don't. don't, and I can't make myself care. Yeah, is that yeah, and 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 also like your you know your ethics and what kept you your core values that kept you together. You know, you you stop caring about that too. Yeah. And you lose yourself in that process. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought what was really powerful, I was coming off of one of my, uh, my rotations in Africa, and we had this mandatory uh, battalion uh, training. It was suicide prevention. It was a lot of that uh, PTSD stuff. Th and that's when it was starting to surface. Yeah. Right? Up until then, we really didn't We Talk hear about, about it. it. I heard about it in the unit a couple of times. But nobody's but talking. It, Back then right, now. but it was more of a threat, like, hey, don't abuse opiates. <laughs> don't do that. Right, don't yeah, do yeah. that. But it wasn't like, okay, where do I seek help? Not that I even knew what yeah. it was back then. Sure. It didn't catch up to me until later on. Mm -hmm. So uh, during the, my process, something was off, something was, you know, not right, off center. Mm -hmm. So we had a mandatory uh, training, and you came on the training. You were uh, came on the screen. You came on the screen, and I always respected you, you know, yeah. and in that in a warrior aspect, and and I'm hearing what you have to say because up until now, it's some it's some person that's not really yeah. in my community that yeah, yeah. that can even relate to me, you know. Yeah. So now I okay, now I'm hearing a warrior's voice, and then you you said you know f it was one of those the video where you had fireworks and mm -hmm. you say hey you know some people look at the beautiful fireworks some people you know it, it brings up memories mm -hmm. you know and I, and I remember uh, during that time you know I never looked at fireworks like that but I, I had certain smells that would bring the energy oh, yeah. back the smell is uh, Huge was the thing biggest thing too. temperature too yeah change in temperature volumetric pressure I could I could relate to it to uh, a situation I've been in yeah and that brought anxieties that I couldn't control, mm -hmm. you know. And um, so I was really selective of who I talked to when I was in the military because you don't really have that support mechanism on the teams, right? You can't go to a, a group of type A meat eating looking <laughs> green berets and go, hey, I think I have a problem. So you, so I held it, and plus I was their team sergeant, so I have to truly right, hold it. You're right, you're leader. All right. Yeah. So I hold it. I held in the pain, and then I realized that um, I was uh, I was off my path. You weren't being congruent with who you knew you yeah. were. Yeah, and and I realized that I lost my way, you know. And at that time, when you when you realize you lost your way, then you make decisions, right? Now, okay, I, there's something wrong with me. Can't put it on, but there's something wrong. With me. So I started seeking 
uh, some therapy, started, started talking to some people, got more educated on what what could possibly happen, you know, TBI, PTSD, or it's real. And I'm like, yeah. wow, this is real. <laughs> this is <laughs> real, yo. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, oh, whatever. It's, it's, but, you know, I always believed you because I respect you, but I thought it wasn't true for me. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, we, we have different paths, and I think what I'm going through is a little bit different. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, right. Uh, but the process of healing is different, right? Because yes. we, we go through our... our our process. So my process was, you know, first I had, I was done. Mm -hmm. You know, I was done with the military. My father told me one time, he said, son, you know when you're done. Mm -hmm. Because I asked him one time after uh, there was a couple of rotations that I took bad rotations over in Iraq during the height of the yeah. war. And I came back and I'm like, man, you know, I think I'm done. He goes, no, you're not. You know when you're done. You won't think. Yeah, right. You, you and, then he, and then and then he's right because there was no thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, and there's no convincing the other way either. Yeah, so after my rotations in Africa, I was done. And I got out, and uh, that's when I, my life just, it, it became a dark hole. All right, so my wife was working up in Denver at the time, and I just retired out of the, of the military, medically mm -hmm. uh, retired. And I would lay in bed all day, and the curtains would be down. And when she come home, I'm still in bed all day. And I, I, <laughs> this how hard headed it was. I equated to I was just tired. Yeah, man. yeah. Dude, I did 23 rest. years yeah, in. Yeah, I'm it's tired. It's time to rest. Come on. Right. Yeah. And, and and people told me, oh yeah, just take a break. I'm like, oh, 23 years. I'm tired. You know. And uh, that wasn't the case. I was actually depressed. <laughs> 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 Who knew? Who would know? Right. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm, I'm depressed. And um. And I, I really owe that to, so during the height of the war, when you're on a certain unit, you are kind of like the national level, right? Yeah. So you are, you're the best, whatever, whatever you do. At yeah. that time, I did a lot of surveillance. So I, I was trained on certain aspects of the team, needed certain information. I would go in these countries, collect the data, send it back. I was really good at that, but I realized that there was a certain point that I, I lost it, mm -hmm. lost my way, you know, so I got out, and uh, I went into a deep state of depression, um, the army, when you, like I said, when you're that needed at that level, they're going to give you whatever you need yeah. to, to keep you on the battlefield, yeah. so I have a lot of injuries, you know, I took a, um, a IED in 05, uh, my neck, my lower back, so I started having a lot of issues, and they would prescribe you opiates mm -hmm. you know well anybody who's known that even if you take what the doctors prescribe you it's 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 going to fail yeah because it's dependent it's it's a uh, you're going to quickly grow a dependence on that dependency that, right? it changes your physiology it does it, and it uh, and then through time it changes the way you think things mm -hmm. you know so during uh the war they will give us uh medicine to stay awake, they'll give us medicine to go to bed, they'll <laughs> give us medicine to feel a certain way, they'll give us medicine to hide some pain. So you're just medicating yourself off what you want to feel for the next five minutes. Yeah. Right? And that's no way to live. Yeah. Not at all. So I realized my, my judgment was being clouded by this. So I woke up one morning and I uh, opened up my medicine cabinet and things were falling out of my medicine cabinet. <laughs> it was full. Yeah, it was full, right? And uh, I had energy there. So when I said I had energy, I wanted to change for that, mm. for that moment. I wanted to be better because, you know, 20 minutes from then, it could have been, oh, I, I really just want a pill. You know right. what I mean? So I, I took advantage of that, that window. That window. And I took everything and I dumped it all down the toilet and I flushed it and I suffered. All right? Because when I say I suffered is that wall of medication was up. So that means all of the pain, the emotion was Physical, blocked. emotional, all of it. Yeah. Everything. So when you take that medication away, <laughs> I dealt the full, mm. you know, mm. I was on the X yeah. pretty much. Oh, um, yeah. And um, I suffered. I suffered through it, um, and after I would say about six months of uh, suffering and withdrawing, uh, I, I I went to a state of numbness, you know. Yeah. And um, during that process, I opened up an old book called the Book of Five Rings, mm -hmm. 
by Miyamoto Masashi, right? So Miyamoto Masashi was a ronin, and he was born in the late 1500s, and he rose to one of the most superior swordsmen of his time, but he balanced it with philosophy and uh, his ability of Zen mind, and you know, so yeah. he was the full warrior. Full warrior. Right, and physically, I emotionally, spiritually. Exactly, he was everything that uh, I try to be since I was a boy because I I walked a path with the martial arts, mm -hmm. so I can truly relate to it. I tried to read it the first time when I was fourteen, didn't understand. Look at that, right? <laughs> right, right. right, but how could you? You know, at that age, you don't understand. But now, when I read through it, it made sense. But one of the first things was don't look for strength externally. Everything comes from within. And, you know, up until that point, I would call my father. I would call him and say, you know, how would you, how did you get over it? And I would call some of my ex-teammates, like, hey, how are you guys doing? What I was doing is I was looking for strength everywhere else External. but the one that truly mattered, mm. which is me. So uh, my first process was to cut out the noise. So when I say cut out the noise, it's <laughs> cut out all the negative things in my life. All the negative thoughts, all the negative people that talk bad about you. You know, yeah. the culture, yeah. right? The culture that I was indoctrinated in that, you know, we, we talked about it. If you work within special operations, my, my whole career has been pretty much, you know. Oh, yeah. it, there's a culture to it. Yeah, and absolutely. you don't mean to be cocky, but there's a uh, there's an ego. There's an arrogance to that culture. It's not bad. It's it your confidence. You have to high, and in, in some cases, I would even say it's just an uber high level of competence. So the level of confidence from yeah. those players at times necessary. is necessary. It's like, hey, fucking, it's just the way, you know, that aspect of it. Yeah. yeah. And it's designed to keep that way. And there's not room. And that, that's why it's like I don't have anything against it. There's not room in that culture for some yeah. of the stuff we talk about. No. And just a little point, uh, not to lose that topic yeah, you yeah. were on, was the, because uh, when you were talking about the purity, the getting to martial arts at its pure level, you know what I mean, which is about killing and war, is completely congruent because the same thing over times of peace happened with U.S. military. You know, the U.S. military was designed and is designed for one thing and one thing only, and that is to kill the enemies of this country. Not to police things up, not to, you know what I mean, do this politicians and other folks level. So that way the congruency between what you were doing in the martial arts, going to the pure state of it, just was congruent and matched with what you were in the US military, which to kill your enemies. Not to be some kind of, you know, crazy, yeah. you know what I mean, sociopath or, or, or psychopath, but it was like it fit the job description, yeah. you know what I mean? And then back to this kind of a culture that we lived in, not speaking ne negatively, not that arrogance, that confidence, like you have to be, because people will say, it's like, well, are you competitive? It's like, <laughs> you would get in a fight, you know what I mean, yeah. on the weekends, you know what I mean, just kind of for fun, but to learn and yeah. everything. And it's like, yeah, man, get in a gunfight. Like, there's no ref, yeah. there's no... You know, thing is like, it's the ultimate competition. Absolutely. I mean, you know, war is the ultimate competition, you know, where only one person is going to win for this, mm -hmm. you know. So it just all kind of fits, which goes back to what we were saying. Hey, it's perfect. It's clear. It's crystal clear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's uh, what we were designed for at a cellular level. You know what I mean? And it just, it just fit. And then when all of that is over, because it all ends, that phase of it, you know, because I always call it back yeah. to, I used to think that my prowessness on the battlefield is what defined me as a warrior. And at that time, you know, yeah. it, it did. It did, it that's did. true, you at know, that moment. The thing is with us is we didn't die in battle, right? I mean, so we, we, we didn't die, so therefore we had to continue. And the continue, which is still that we always talk about, you know, is still the warrior path but it's much different yes. than when we were the guys out there doing it. You know mm -hmm. I mean? We didn't die, you know, and then like what you were saying, which is most, most folks, not all, because some, you know, then the struggles that you talked oh, yeah. about and then that ego and stuff. And it was like, okay, how do I, how do I get through that? Yeah. Like, how do I do it on my own? Cause no one's sitting no there with you there. at two o'clock in the morning, no. 
whenever you know you're coming out of your skin or even like the the programs the military have set up they they irritate me more than they help me because i'm sitting across from this doctor that has no clue on anything i've been through he read books um he knows the scientific uh answers to it but that's not what i'm looking for sometimes you know he doesn't understand what's going what we deal Mm -hmm. what we have to deal with you know and uh and that's when I had to look internally, mm-hmm. right? So I meditated. I, I, I started my process of meditation. So meditation is the ability to, to, to live in a space where there's no past and there's no future. There's only the present moment. So when I say that is to truly sever the emotions of the past and the desires of the future, mm-hmm. to truly live life for what it is. And with that comes a lot of clarity. Right, because you 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 eliminate the the ego, the uh, the desires, you know, the selfishness of of of, of a normal human, you know, pain, the, the pain, pain good, the suffering, the bad, all that. All you, of it. you eliminate everything, and you truly live in in a place of what is. Mm-hmm. It, it took me a while. <laughs> it's not like it, <laughs> you know. I meditated, and I'm like, wow, it's there. No, one of the you know the things we're always talking about on the show is taking action. Um, it's the, the thoughts are great. The desire is amazing yet until you take that step, right? So you, you, you have made it to a point, um, and Tom hit on it. Of, we lived in a world where things were very clear, mm-hmm. very black and white. I was it told there's Beautiful. no clearer world in combat mm-hmm. because the scoreboard fucking, when you wake up, it is what it is. And when you go to bed, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and you and I, I'll speak in, you know, I, when I moved from that, just like you did, to uh, people say, why is it hard to adjust? Well, this world here is complex. Yeah. There's emotion ranges needed to deal in interpersonal and romantic relationships that uh, I believe, I know I shut down and to be successful in combat, right? So some of these things that I think you're talking about, uh, it's predictable. No one ever talked to them about us. Back to that, we that, trained. that elder... A uh, class of warrior uh, that, that doesn't exist, uh, hasn't existed since probably World War II vets were the last one to get elders that came out of World War One, and ever since then, you know. Um, and so, we, you know, I come home, and, and so I have to l- learn to deal how, uh, in, in the complex world of this normal society. Outside of the military. Outside of that, right? And I know for me, you know, I've done everything from spiritual pilgrimages, so to speak, from ayahuasca ceremonies to spending time out in nature, um, to writing, to reading, all these things that I did and and that Tom does. And back to the point you made, there's not a one size fits all. Right. Right. Uh, Tom brings, brought up a valid point years ago. It's like people can write relationship books all they want. Like I can go read men, uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, and then, like Tom says, there's not a book out there for Lori. It's his yeah, wife, right, his wife's name, and there's not a book out there. Um, and so, I, what you described, or I heard, is when I have a clinician or a clinical s- person sitting across the table from me, they're doing the best they can, man. Right. And they're absolutely doing the best they can. What they don't know is, is with me, you're never gonna win. Like you're not gonna get through to me. It's impossible. Right. And that, that comes back to what kicked Tom and I off with, the, you know, the documentary that was done, which was like, hey, warriors healing warriors, mm-hmm. because I don't know what your path is. You don't know what mine is yet. Whenever I share mine with you or with other people, it gives them at least the opportunity to think, hey, one, if they don't have a plan, use twos, yeah. use mine, use Tom as a point of reference. until then. You know, and then once you get that point where it's time to walk on your own, walk on your own. Mm-hmm. And, and that's really what I want to tee up is you, you found yourself in a place and you and I and Tom were talking before we turned the, the mics on today about, you know, yeah, we're team guys, 100 percent. And uh, we, we I, I do say we because I know we are. Um, yet there's times in this journey um, that it is required alone. to walk alone. Mm-hmm. Um and you made a very, very clear decision on that path, and you took a spiritual journey, at least that's my, my perception of what you did, to go deeper into the source of your own power, right? Which is everything you're saying is, is, is so aligned with where we're at because what you said was is you realized that you were seeking power outside. 
yeah. and it doesn't exist outside. And you finally realize that no one is going to create clarity for you but you. No different than Tom has realized or I've, like, no one's made sense out of this for me. No politician, no book, no anything. Final clarity comes from when I say things are the way they are.